You're on 121.5, the emergency frequency. Welcome to the 21.5 Show, a podcast for professional pilots by professional pilots. Join Dylan and Max, both with experience in flight instruction, the airlines, and business aviation, as they talk to a variety of industry experts, share stories, and have a little fun along the way. It's 21.5, the podcast for the pros, with two pros behind the mic. Hello, my name is Dylan. And I'm Max. Welcome back, folks. It's been a busy two weeks, Max. Um, Very busy. Somebody foolishly allowed us to go out to a golf course and do a live podcast broadcast. <laughs> we, it was more of a heckle fest than a podcast. Maybe the uh, double Jack and Cokes. <laughs> was that a good idea? I don't know. Um, we recorded a little bit of it. We'll play some highlights at the end of the episode. Um, it was fun. We had a good time. I'm not sure everybody involved had a good time. No, no. Some people... Uh, let's just say at one point, um, you asked the Gulfstream sales rep when their next turboprop offering would be. <laughs> well, no, I was trying to push him because the Falcon rep had said that they're you know coming out with a new airplane and... I go, what's what's next on the plate for Gulfstream? And he, they, they were just kind of being like, Ugh. they weren't you know, interested in talking like, to us. A, are you bringing back the G one? Remember they're <laughs> walking away. I just like at that. It. It's like, well, yeah, we talked to the uh, Gulfstreams, or I'm sorry, the uh, Falcon sales rep, and it was before they had announced it. But it actually, I don't know if you saw in the news, it's the Falcon 10X. Yeah, I, I, that, that's yeah. the extent of my knowledge. That's the extent. That There's a couple the... interesting things that came. I mean, it's just incredibly wide cabin. I think it's almost like a foot wider than than the biggest global or um, or uh, Gulfstream. Yeah, and then uh, here was the interesting thing from the pilot standpoint. Two things I saw, three things actually. Number one, the cockpit has lie flat seats so that you can nap in the cockpit, like. Like that's going to be, seats? yeah. So apparently they said it's a regular, to, they're anticipating a change in the regs where that's going to be possible. So that was number one. So that'll be cool because that means behind your seat, there's going to be a ton of room, which would be nice to like store. I wonder why they decided to make it wider. Like I've never been in a Gulfstream or Global and been like, God, this should really be, you know, I guess if it's wider, if it's a bigger diameter, you could, but I can stand up and walk through those airplanes. And I mean, I'm I don't know six foot tall because it can't like, get any longer. This is only, that's the last frontier. You can just go wide. <laughs> I don't I know. guess I don't know. I mean, I'll tell you, a lot of people. There is a, a, a certain width that at some point people really like, like the Challenger that I fly. People love it because it's wide. I don't know. Anyways, so that was interesting. Number one, number two, it only has one thrust lever. I don't know what that means. I don't know what this... I don't, yeah, I, I mean, don't know. I guess it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, why not? It, it's but the, I guess, I'm sure it puts the... Uh, adds rudder for you, too, when an engine fails. Has yeah. To, right? Oh, yeah. I'm sure it does everything. It's got... I'm full... I, I guess there... I haven't seen how, but there's some way to, like, isolate it so you can, like, rotate a knob or select which engine you actually want to control with it. If you need to just control one, you can. So I'll be curious to see how that all works out. One step closer. I know. Exactly. And then, uh, yeah, and then speaking of one step closer, um, the last thing that I saw was interesting. You know, I talked about doing the upset recovery program a couple couple months ago. Now there's actually an upset recovery button in the cockpit. So apparently if you push it, it will get you back to straight and level. One more step. Yeah. So I don't even... Why I do they even... I suppose that's an easy way to solve the upset yeah. problem. Yeah, I guess. Well, so. I... I it, and if it has some sort of logic where it's going to yeah. upset you on its own. You know? Yeah. It's, um, I guess it's in there. The, the single th- uh, thrust lever and the upset recovery button are both like already in the, one of the Mirage fighters, I guess. So they're just kind of transferring that tech. I mean, you can buy a Meridian that'll land itself now. Yeah. What's the, so, we're, how much longer? So I, I think the, the message is definitely, you know, spend lots and lots of money in flight training if you're young right now. It's a super bright. <laughs> Very encouraging. <laughs> we'll, we'll delete that. Uh, anyways, so Max. I mean, did, literally, you think about every time and see domestic CPDLC pretty soon. We don't have to talk on the radio. Yeah. 
is the piece. How long until we can just sit in the back and I watch know. the in-flight entertainment? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be like deadheading, but it's all deadheads. We, we have to. We keep saying we're going to do an episode on this, but we got to find the right guest. And I don't know who that is right now. For so, automation? So, yeah. Or for, for like pilotless yeah. stuff? I, so if any of our listeners know who we should talk to about this, I think it's just be fascinating to hear about like what's really coming. I mean, I wonder who, but I wonder if any, like I know Boeing was doing testing mm-hmm. with a standalone. That robot. Thing yeah, that would in go there, yeah. into a cockpit. It wasn't yeah. a whole avionics change. Yeah. set it in there. And I'm sure the guy that's in charge of that or gal I'm sure they're not going to talk to us, right? It's just too... You're going to get everyone all worked up. That's why so, we've got to break through. We have to use our investigative skills to uh, crack into the to the uh, the secret layer. I don't know. It just seems like, to me, I feel like... It doesn't it seem like there'll be one pilot and then there's going to be some pilot sitting in a sim somewhere standing by to link in uh, that's what who knows dude yeah who knows this is like trying to decipher when an airline's gonna hire yeah breaking news there is an airline hiring there's many airlines hiring right now um i just saw the posting for breeze airways we talked about uh that before breeze and um and they're doing something interesting and it got a lot of buzz on social media about um I'll try and find the link for you are you talking about the flight attendant hiring? The flight attendant deal. No, that's, that's been, uh, yeah. they pivoted on that already. Oh, did they? Yeah, that was in the news. It, the, the, the program is still there, but it's not like their main like yeah. source of... but it's like a tuition reimbursement plan. Yeah. And they pay for your housing, and then they pay for your tuitions, and you do like online school. Yeah, but they said they didn't get they didn't get enough staff out of this program yeah. that they were going to need, so now... So they made a little adjustment. I mean, I'll tell you what. I'm in favor of any program that minimizes your debt when you're getting into aviation. Yeah, it was it was so, revolutionary. I, I commend yeah. them for giving it a shot. And so. it seems, seems like they're still going to have a segment of that. It's just not mm-hmm. the, their yeah. main bread and butter. Is yeah. What they, yeah. They realize. So exactly. Um, yeah. So anyways, and it looks like they're hiring uh 220 pilots and UN 90 pilots. So it'll be interesting. I mean, they've, the guy's got a proven track record. So it's a it's it's the gamble of going to the low pay, probably not a very good contract. It's funny because that's what it. everyone always says. Yeah. Oh, he's got, it's Neilman. He's got to prove he's done this before. But everybody trips sometimes, you know. So yeah. who, who knows? It's yeah. just, it's an interesting. See what happens. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, lots of good hiring news. Um, other good news. We literally should go back a year ago and play some clips from oh, our, geez. our yeah. podcast. <laughs> we got to do that. The good news is it's not like it's stored up on the internet for forever. So we never have to worry <laughs> about who our words coming back to haunt us. Um, donations. Got a lot. Do you want to recognize all these people really quick? Caleb G, Rachel S, Damian W, Richard S, Landon P. All are coming and donating for the very hot tumblers. Yeah. Yes. They've and been sold out. Sold out. No more left. Yeah. I was a, a little apprehensive when I ordered them at first, and I didn't know because we had to do a little significant outlay of capital, but it worked out pretty well. I'm excited. Yeah. So we're sold out. I put a little vote up on social media on what to do next. You had mentioned you wanted to do coffee cups, so we're going to do coffee cups. We put it up to a vote online, and we had two slogans up there. One was, flexibility is the key to air power. And the other one was never take financial advice from a pilot. <laughs> Which one do you think won in a landslide? <laughs> the f- I would have thought the flexibility, but yeah. the, the other one, huh? Yeah. Never in a t- landslide? Yeah. It's like two thirds of the votes. I continue to be amazed. I know. So we're going to make the coffee cups. I think we're go- we were looking at the 10 ounce, like the smaller ones, but I think we're going to do the regular like 20 ounce tumbler, big coffee cup from Yeti. They're going to be... They're a little bit more expensive, so it's going to be... If you donate 85 bucks, we'll send you one of those. I'm going to order them soon, and then we'll ship them out. Uh, 215podcast.com on the donate button on, on the bottom, and then we'll have those out. And I'll post a picture of what that's going to... The Yeti mocks it up for you so you can see what it looks like, but it should be pretty cool. Um, the problem is is that I, I always say that, and the, but I always feel like I'm like talking to people about financial stuff. So I need to take my own advice. <laughs> I really need that cup. <laughs> People are always, oh, tell me about Bitcoin. Oh, what about that? You know, I was just like, I, should, I need to shut up. I don't think you offer advice, though. You <laughs> offer information, what yeah, you know, yeah. and what you're doing. But you don't say, 
this is what you should do. Yeah. You're not a soapbox kind of guy. I'm not a soapbox guy. You know, you know who does tell you what you should do sometimes and, and does a good job of educating you is our friends over at Advanced Air Crew Academy, though. Online courses, training, modules. Those guys are a wealth of information, as we learned from our last episode where we talked a to you. A veritable Erica. cornucopia of knowledge. Yeah. Uh, aircrewacademy.com. You can check out their website. They have an awesome blog. We steal stuff from their blog all the time. Um, great content just to keep you current on um, all of the industry topics. And actually, their LinkedIn, the actual Very Advanced powerful. Aircrew Academy LinkedIn is really, really good. So I highly recommend following them. I'll put a link for that as well. Um, so thanks to our friends at Advanced Aircrew Academy for their support. Uh, all right. Review. I made the font bigger so we can read these now. Finally. They're so old. Um, you, you can do that one. The podcast we all needed and didn't even know it. What do you do when you wake up in that Holiday Inn Express in Oakland as the industry collapses around you and aviation's ap- apocalypse seems at hand? Brew a cup of hotel room, plastic tainted coffee, and Ugh. fire up the 215 podcast. And put it in a new 215 podcast tumbler. Right? Calm, calm down. <laughs> Seriously, this is the humor we all needed over the past year. I'm betting these two didn't expect to be the thing that helped us all get through 2020, but that is what happened, and we should all be fortunate for it. Thanks for stepping up, gentlemen. Keep it up, and don't stop playing that furlough flute. Um, Give the people what they want. That's right. Okay, this one's for you, Wasabi. Thank you for the review. Appreciate it. That's my favorite one. It's the hiring horn now. Um, so uh, we'll uh, get some stickers out to uh, Wasabi for writing an email or a review for us on Apple. And uh, if you write a review for us, we will do the same. Just send us a message with your mailing address. Uh, Lots in the mailbag today. (laughs) This was a funny one. (laughs) We got an email from Anuj. And he said, I would like to personally congratulate you as your website, 215 Podcast, has been selected by our panelists as one of the top 45 pilot podcasts on the I web. cannot believe you're reading that one. <laughs> I just thought it was funny because I emailed him back. I mean, it, clearly it's like a scam to get you to sign up for their thing. And I was like, I wasn't even aware there are 45 pilot podcasts in existence at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> what, did you get a response? No, of course not. It's just like, oh, you know, register it. Or, do you remember those like top 45? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like what like, 50 have been more round yeah, number? Exactly. For number Shout four. out to Anuj. Yeah, thank you, Anuj. Thank you, Anuj. Um, do you remember when we were in like growing up in like high school? They would send out that who's who of college students thing. Yeah, and it was just a scam to get you to like pay fifty dollars to put your profile in a book that they would then sell. <laughs> yeah, it's the same thing. I think so. We're killing it. Are you sure? I did you ask him exactly where we ranked though in the yeah top that's what I you got to pay for that I think <laughs> so I don't know so keep writing those comments subscribing liking sharing with your friends we might crack the top thirty seven next year appreciate that um all right here you can read this one this is pretty good why can no one spell your name right I've never I don't think I've ever met a Dylan that spells it like that it's D Y L A N yeah for it's the okay. record. Hi, Max and Dylan. I was recently listening to the episode with Erica and wanted to share an experience I had with a flight flight attendant this week. We were sitting in the back of a pretty empty flight, and I asked him about commuting for the airlines and his version of reserve because that's one of the weakest areas I have in aviation. And it being my job coming up pretty soon, I really wanted advice about that lifestyle. He then told me that his ultimate goal was to become a pilot, and he was also very nervous and questioned the lifestyle of what that kind of career. What? I think he's saying what that career looks like. Is okay. What they're saying. He then made the decision to become a flight attendant to immerse himself in aviation to see if it was the type of lifestyle he'd be like before he spent $150,000 on flight training. I've never thought about it that way to have a, have in a career in the airline prior to cashing in the ticket for all of your training. I think that may be really good advice for future pilots to put themselves in a flight attendant job and save money and slowly do your flight training to see if it's a good career fit for you while also gaining a reputation with an airline. Aaron. Good perspective. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I remember my new hire class at Eagle, we had a, a guy that was transitioning from in flight to the front and had done exactly that. Yeah. I think that... For some folks, the, that is really important, is understanding that how the lifestyle works, because it's very 
unique and it's hard to explain to someone that's never been exposed to it. You know, what's interesting about that too is think about the perspective you would have as a captain having worked in the back. Because I, I'll tell you, it was interesting. And one of my feedbacks when I was in airline training before, I was like, you know, they do a really great job of telling you everything you're supposed to do. I mean, it's literally, for those of you that haven't been in airline, it's all written out step by step. You could it, you could go home, read the book, and know how to perform pretty much every function of your job, right? What they don't do a great job of telling you about is what everybody else is supposed to be doing. And when you're new... That's the stuff you figure out on the yeah, job. Yeah, right. But it's interesting because you pull into the gate, you're like, well, who, like, you just don't know what they're supposed to do with the bags. And you don't really know what the flight's in. You don't know what everyone else is supposed to do. All you know is your little circle, which is all you're really required yeah. to know. But it does help you gain a lot of perspective on how the whole operation works. And then and you're like, well, what the, when are they supposed to do it? And the captain you know, will tell you. And yeah. you kind of figure that stuff out as you go. But it, but it, it would be really interesting to work in one of those jobs and then transition to another side. Yeah. I think definitely for some people that could be a, a, a good route to go, especially if you're going to drop a lot of coin. You don't have to be a flight attendant for a real long time. You could do go to be a flight attendant regional for six months, probably. Wouldn't that be great if uh, like at, the, at all these ab initio-ish programs that are coming out is like for a summer they send you out on the line as like an internship to to to, to do like as an just as an intern to ride like with the, you do a week with the the flight attendants and then you do a week with the baggage handlers and the week with the cargo guys and yeah like, that would be actually pretty cool would be the airline ops internship do i don't it. know what benefit it would provide to the airline but it, yeah know, before, hmm. more well-rounded well well yeah yeah so i think i think that's good i mean look like we've said a million times it's avoiding debt uh increasing flexibility all of those things are very important to us so if if you're on the fence about investing a ton of money into training and you know that that could definitely be a, a viable option it's kind of like a paid internship yeah in, in a sense very low paid yeah <laughs> especially if you're in a regional flight attendant. i mean someone told me the regional at some point, you know, the, the whole thing was structured where it was basically like they, they only want to retain somebody for about a year to a year and a half. What is it? Do you know what the training footprint is? Like how long does it take? I don't I don't know. It's mm -hmm. not very much. I mean, so. That's probably someone we should interview, honestly, is like a long, uh, someone that's been a flight attendant for 30 years yeah. and seen, gone through this, but from their perspective, because obviously we present everything from the the pilot perspective. It would be pretty interesting to hear. Yeah, they'd have a lot of positive things to say about pilots, would be my guess. Um, last email <laughs> comes from Landon. Uh, my dude's been listening to your sarcasm for the past few months. Oh, I just had some sarcasm right there. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> How do you think our wives yeah. feel? Generally, when I'm out attempting to get my son to sleep on a walk or while I'm hating life while running and realizing that my body doesn't like doing that anymore, going through a big life change now, transitioning from military to civilian life and listening to you guys has really helped with the perspective. I've especially enjoyed the ego decision checks that Max points out. Like, don't act like you've got the job until you've got the job. And then you can start to make decisions. And by decisions, I mean uh, decisions since there's no decisions to make if you've only got one offer. Yes. There you go. I've had a tendency lately to think I need to make decisions between jobs when I haven't even had a solid offer from a single company. Thanks for keeping my ego in check and also doing it while making many of us laugh. You guys are great. I hope you keep the content coming and the sarcasm on par with James from Raven. Uh, now to go have my last bit of bourbon before I'm in a van down by the river. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Landon. Uh, that's right. That's been our lesson. Um, okay. We have gotten a lot of emails for flight advice. So, um, I thank you for everyone that's written in. We're just tackling these one per episode right now. So it might take a couple episodes to get your question answered. Um, but we might uh, have to ramp this up to two. When I know I have some ideas on here's what I was. Well, we'll save that for later. Um, I got some ideas on, on how to do that. But anyways, um, so thank you for writing in. We've got one. You've got one, right? I do. Yeah. So. It wasn't necessarily somebody writing in for advice, but it was just uh, a conversation that I was having with one of our mutual friends okay. the other day. So, he was talking about he's in a great job, like 91, very happy, doesn't have to fly that much, great schedule, the owner's awesome, everything. He loves everything about the job. Yeah. 
but he needs to gain more flight time quicker. And he was previously working in an airline and then everything, you know, went downhill and he, he came to the business aviation side. Um, so he, he loves that stuff. He's kind of in his mid twenties, um, like 1500 ish hours, somewhere around there. So he's kind of in that zone and, and he's like, you know, this hundred hour a year thing is great, but like, I got to look long-term and what do I do? And I don't want to go back to the airline. He's going to take a pay cut and you know, have a worse quality lie, all this stuff. And, and he, he does, he, we've talked about previously about taking a little time to smell the roses in this business and, and not just trying to hammer it out to get to a major airline as young as possible, which is great for some people. Some people it's not, it's just good to kind of have that perspective and make your decision. So he's of the, uh, he's not in a super big hurry. He loves aviation, wants to get a lot of different experience, this and that. So what I said is I'm like, well, he's on a good airplane that has a lot of opportunity for contracting, right? Which is great. You get to fly, you make more money. Um, and his boss is, is cool with it. He encourages them to go out and fly when they're not flying. Cause he, he understands the position he's in, which is, which is also a big plus cause not everybody's like that. Um, and so I said, well, what are you doing to try and increase the kind of contract flying you do? I'm like, it sounds like you have the time. So there's no reason you shouldn't be. I'm, he's like, yeah, I would love to do more. I'm like, well, what do you do? He goes, well, nothing. I just kind of wait around for people to call me to go. And I'm like, you realize there's other ways to tackle this. And I'm like, and I kind of told him what you say. There's big Facebook groups about contract and there's websites that are specifically for that. I'm like, you know, you could call a big charter operator and you could, if you go to just 91 vanilla training, you could also go under someone's 135 training for the sim. It, it accomplishes the same goal as your 91 job. Yeah. And then you could go through the ground school. You could get in someone's 135 certificate and be super valuable as an independent contractor there. I mean, there's a lot of ways I said, what, what the problem is, if you don't do that now, you're going to maybe get recalled to where you're at, or you're going to be put into a corner where you have to make a decision and you're not going to know what the, what, what the full potential of what you have already in front of you. So you, you got to do that now versus then, you know, at least say, okay, I'm confident I can get another hundred hours a year. That puts me at 200 hours a year or whatever it is. And, or I could go here and fly this much. Then it's quantified. You can make an informed decision where if you don't, and then you're like, Oh, well, if I turn this down, I really need to get on that contract stuff and try and then you don't, you don't know what the unrealized potential is. So, so that was one of those things again, trying to get all the information to be able to make the best decision. And sometimes you have to be a little bit more aggressive in your tactics. Yeah. Was my advice. But what do you think? Uh, yeah, no, I agree with everything you said as far as, well, it's interesting because there's really two questions. One is how do I get more contract flying? And then two is, should I be, you know, what should I do as a 1500 hour pilot? Right. Those are kind of two different questions. So yeah, as far as the contracting stuff, look, we've one other thing, you know, I'm a big proponent of is you should be building relationship with salespeople too. Who, who, what airframe is that? Is he on a Learjet? I should know the OEM Learjet guy by first name basis uh, because I should know all the guys that do the pre-owned in my area. I should have relationships with all of those guys. There's a federal registry you can start to search out, you know, on the FAA website and you can kind of figure out what airframes are around now, you you know, and then that that might help you on LinkedIn. And then you can start to try and connect with the people that are, um, that are flying them. I mean, the, the bottom line is though, with contract flying that we've both learned is it's all very relationship based. You're never going to just get on a website and the phone's going to ring. I, mean, I shouldn't say that's not, that's not true. It depends on it your depends type. It depends right? on the type and the supply and demand and everything else. But in general, if you put in all of the networking efforts, the same that you would do for a job, you know, where you're talking to recruiters and other things, this one's just getting yourself established in the community. I think it's that. And, also, probably to a lesser extent, but still significant, is to make yourself more valuable yeah. than the other guy. And and the reason I say that is when we were flying charter back in the day on the beach jet, and we got sucked into that whole jet direct what, oh, yeah, yeah. conglomerate, mm-hmm. right? And their ops manual said it had to be another jet direct dude, even for managed airplanes that were part 91. Wow, yeah, okay. And this yeah. guy, so remember, they would fly me. Mm-hmm. I would fly from Phoenix to Teterboro or to New York. 
stay in a hotel. I'd wake up the next day, fly the owners from Teterboro to West Palm, stay another night in a hotel, and they would airline me home. So it was three days of contract flying for like one leg. Or yeah, for one leg. <laughs> yeah. And it was crazy. But that was because obviously they had no choice. And I was the only dude that was yes. qualified, even though I was on the other yeah. side of the country. No. And that was my point, too, is if especially some of these, even some of these smaller charter operators that have several of the same type, they get everybody gets put in a real pickle at those places when somebody wants to go on vacation or calls in sick and they have a trip booked or an owner trip and this yeah. and that. Um, and if it's a charter there's nothing really you have, can do. Their hands are tied unless there's somebody available. So yeah. And uh, yourself as yeah, as for you our can. listeners, it doesn't that don't cost you anything. It's not like yeah. you're paying to go get a type, you know, like some people if do to there. make themselves yep. valuable. You just yep. taking what you already have and working with it. Work it. Yep. And for our listeners that don't understand how 135 works, you, it's not like you can, if you're typed in the airplane, you can't just show up and fly. Like there's a lot of extra, yeah, you got to go, go through, through an in-doc, the you got to go through ground a special, school, yeah. got to go to sim training in their, on their training profile. There's a lot of stuff yeah. that goes on. So, and on smaller airplanes, they typically don't run with more than two pilots per airplane. So there isn't a lot of extra staffing to absorb. So anyways, good advice. Now, circling back to the other question, you're 1500 hours in your young pilot this is the trap that I fell into, and it's easy for people to do. I had 1,500 hours. I left the airline. I got a great Part 91 job, didn't fly a ton, had a great quality of life, wasn't married, didn't have kids. And then at some point, I had to basically go and fly a bunch more because I really, I think 3,000 is still like a pretty good number to get to. Don't you think? Total time? It's so subjective. It's very it subjective. I guess you know, my, I think you needed five to six thousand roughly to be competitive yeah. at the big airlines. Yeah, I think um, that so the, that, the point is you need you're probably going to need to invest two to three years of your life somewhere getting a lot of reps. I would say at some yeah, point in your career, but the smart time to do that is when you're super young, is when you're in your when 20s, yeah. you don't have any kids, you don't yeah. have a wife. Yeah. And, and that, the other thing I told him, I'm like, look, if you want some great experience and some good stories and, and things go fly international 135 go oh, get yeah. on a cabin go fly for like you're gonna be gone and you're gonna something. be hustling but you're gonna see some cool stuff yeah go fly hardcore on a like a g4 and just yeah and just yeah. hammer it so um so i i guess that my my perspective to share is you're probably gonna have to sink two to three years of your life into somewhere that flies you know 800 hours a year at some point in your career you're gonna need to do that so as you it you know, look at your life, then you just kind of have to understand when is the window of that opportunity going to be the easiest to accomplish. So good advice. Okay. We have a ton of other ones too, um, that I'm looking forward to reading in future episodes. So thanks for that. Okay. Um, coming up next, uh, special perks. Again, we have more special perks of, uh, our partnerships. We have the formal former, Federal air surgeon is going to come and chat and with us. Former meaning like, <laughs> like just a few months very ago. Recently, yeah. It was, I think it was October yeah. of last year yeah. when, when he was no longer the. Yeah. So he's, he's joined at Harvey Watt. So we have Rob uh, and Dr. Barry from Harvey Watt joining us. We're going to have a pretty interesting conversation. A COVID-19 va- uh, vaccine topic will hit. And then um, we, you, it was kind of an off the wall topic. I was, uh, I wasn't expecting to talk about what well, we got into sleep apnea for a little while too, which is a hot topic for pilots. And I think one that I know I hold like probably some unnecessary bias, not bias against, but like fear of, yeah. you know, and I thought, Oh man, if you get that in your pilot's license, it's going to be a big, huge problem. And, and so we had a good conversation about and that. It was, as well. I think yeah. Yeah, a while and ago. Yeah. Some so, stigma. That was the word I was yeah. looking for. So good conversation with them. Um, so let's kick that off right now. All right, Max, we've got uh, a couple of very special guests on the phone. One of the, the many benefits we've enjoyed from our partnership with our friends over at Harvey Watt. Of course, uh, most of our listeners will remember Rob Alston from Harvey Watt. And also joining us today is Dr. Barry. He's uh, one of the medical advisors at Harvey Watt and also the former federal air surgeon. Welcome to the show, fellas. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate you having us. So, uh, fellas, I wanted to start off first with this memorandum that recently came out from the FAA 
regarding how AMEs should evaluate the airmen and air traffic controllers that have previously had COVID. And I was just curious if you, you might be able to break it down for us, Dr. Barry, a little bit about what AMEs are looking for and what ramifications pilots that have had COVID can expect if they're trying to get their medical back. Well, okay. The, 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 real, the real, I guess, breakdown that uh, a pilot should be aware of is if they've been hospitalized, they're going to get looked at a lot or they should be getting looked at a lot more meticulously by the AMA. If they had COVID and and it was documented that, yes, it really was COVID, either mildly symptomatic or maybe even asymptomatic, and they got a test and they know they had it. But And even if they ended up with a sort of a, a prolonged disease but never required hospitalization, that is, is pretty easy as long as you're you're doing okay as far as the AME is concerned. You know, you can go back to flying. And, and but it needs to. It, the big thing is, it needs to be cleared by the by the AME. It's not something that, like, okay, I've had an upper respiratory infection. You know, self grounding for a week while this thing clears up, and then I just go back to flying. COVID's not that way. You need you need to go. The gatekeeper needs to be the AME in this situation. The real the. The real, more concerning part is if your disease required hospitalization, and that sort of breaks down into two types of hospitalization. If you were in the hospital and it was, you know, only in the hospital and you were not put on a respirator, you not you didn't have to go to the ICU, those kinds of things. If you're fully recovered from your from your illness, even though you were hospitalized, the AME again can issue. He needs to put a lot of notations as to what the hospital course was like and describe all of that so that when it's looked at, the FAA will agree with the AME that, yeah, that was appropriate to, to issue the medical certificate. My question was, if you have COVID and you, you self-quarantine, you go through and then you're starting to feel better, when is at what time do you make the appointment with the AME to say, hey, I had COVID, I'm now recovered here I am. You know, you can you you can, if you're if you're recovered, you've been recovered for a couple of days. Do it. Go ahead and make the make the appointment with the AME, and the AME can make that determination and say, I think you're good to go, and you know, give a clearance at that point in time and send an update to the FAA. You know, technically, as far as any illness is concerned, you know, you don't even have to re- technically, and I say technically or legally, you really don't have to report it till your till your next physical exam for your certificate. So if you say you're you're in your say you're a first class pilot, you get them every and you're age wise, so you're getting them every six months. So you're three months in from your last physical and you end up with COVID, you have symptoms for a couple of weeks and it's minor and you don't even go to the hospital. What do you do at that point in time? What you should do is go to your AME again and say, Okay, I have had COVID and the and the A and B can then you know, document it and, and send that to the FAA and just say, okay, you're good to go. You don't have to issue a new medical certificate at that, at that point in time. Even though if you look at the, if you look at, and, and, and this is my interpretation, and I probably ought to, to make sure, is I don't think there is any reason that you, even though the, you look at the checklist and it says issue, 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 defer, that, you know, you're not really, you don't have to come, I think, for a full renewal of your medical application. I don't think that's what they mean, but that's probably something I ought to clarify before I uh, say too much on that. And, and I would just add that the, the individual airlines are, are imposing different regs just to, just to, you know, triple stamp the double stamp. And so, it may be based on the the fluctuating CDC guidelines. We're having some some of the airlines where they ask you know physicians to review it, you know once the say ten days from the point that the airman's had a marked improvement in symptoms to to prove that the airman is you know is okay to go back. And obviously, Dr. Barry is speaking from a from a legality standpoint, you know from his his post from you know as of October one as the U.S. Federal Air Surgeon. Gotcha. Of what the FAA requires. And so, Rob, I've, you know, as you brought up some of the airlines and, and for many of the professional pilots, are, have you started to see any folks going on disability and your loss of license coverage that's offered through Harvey Water? Are you starting to see people having to use that coverage due to COVID-19? So I pulled the notes right in advance of our call or pulled the data. And the short answer is the COVID cases have 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 been dropping. And the LTD claims, the long-term disability, the loss of license claims are showing recovery from we, we had a we've we've been seeing a gradual surge 
and we're we're starting on the on the backside of that bell curve. And interestingly enough, we're seeing an, a a regular increase, and that's specific to COVID. But we're seeing a a regular increase of the LTD claims ticking back up as people get back to their regular treatment and follow up. You know the the. The joke is things are very black and white with the FAA. You can't be a little bit pregnant. You either have a condition or you or you <laughs> don't. And so we're seeing pilots that may not have even, I mean, obviously with pilots, something that's minor for someone that doesn't fly for a living, you can, you know, take a pill and go to work. But we're seeing those those claims start to tick back up as people are going in for their routine physicals with their doctors, their, you know, not not their A and E physicals but just their routine and their finding conditions they may not have known they had. They thought they just had a, you know, a backache or, you know, something that, that they, that gets diagnosed. And so we're seeing more as folks are going back in for their regular, you know, doctor visits. Uh, So we're seeing regular claims start to keep on going up now. Okay. And then uh, I think one of the other questions I wanted to have answered was regarding the vaccine, you know, the rollout is really, you know, in, in our state here in Arizona, anyone can get it now. I mean, we know the FAA has approved the, the vaccines on the market. And the good news is I haven't read a lot about complications after receiving the vaccine. But what, what would happen to an airman if for, for they did get a vaccine and had a complication? Is there a path to getting their medical back? Is it automatically suspended? Can insurance cover that? Can you guys talk a little bit about that? Well, I'll let Rob do the insurance part. But I, I will say, basically, it's like any other any other illness that one comes up with. They ought to be self-grounding and then whatever the complication happens to be, you know, whether it's resolved or ongoing, you take care of it in that way. If it's, if it's like you feel like hell for a week after the shot and uh, you're fatigued and muscle aches and all that sort of thing, and after a week it's gone, you know, probably wait a couple of days at least to say, okay, I'm truly back to normal again. You ought to document that again with your AME, and the AME says, fine, you can go back. You know, if it's one of these really bad ones, which are rare, but really bad type reaction, then, you know, it's a, it's a case-by-case basis as to how long that's going to end up taking. I mean, I just, you know, if you, I, I keep getting emails personally here with, you know, the catastrophic stories that, that are coming out. As I said, I think those are rare in terms of the millions of uh, vaccine doses that have been given. And there isn't a vaccine that's ever been given that doesn't have, you know, a number of, of severe reactions. My understanding, I don't know, I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but my understanding of uh, the percent with, with this particular vaccine is not any worse. But I, and I, I can't, I couch this with, with some reluctance to give a number, but I don't think it's any worse than any other vaccines have been. But it's not it's certainly not zero. So if you get something like Guillain Barre, which is a bad neurologic situation, we had them with H one N one, we had them with swine flu, those kinds of things also. But that's a bad neurologic situation in which you may end up never recovering from. So again, you, you treat that like any other illness. And, and the, the answer from the insurance perspective is it would be short answer is it'd be covered like any other illness. So it should be no issue at all. Okay. So even that I know I've heard some people say, oh, it's an emergency uh, use uh, authorization, but that doesn't matter as far as from a coverage standpoint. Uh, not with a well-written policy. It sh- should not have any, any, in fact, with, with us approved plans, they can't carve out unique things like that with some of these, Lloyds of London, the insurance that we don't, we purposely don't offer. There's, there's, uh, you can have loopholes in there, but that's, you know, with with the U.S. approved, you know, insurance policy, there should be no issue at all. It'd be treated as any other condition would. Okay, that's good to know. While while we were talking, I emailed the current federal air surgeon, Dr. Northrop, with a question about how to interpret the the issue. The, the use of the word issue on the, the guidelines that came out on COVID. And what I said was that in regard to the new guidelines, are you expecting a new medical certificate application for returning to fly? The guidelines use the word issue. I would assume that if the pilot has a valid medical certificate already, they just need an update with the AMA to inform the FAA. Am I interpreting this correctly? The answer is yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Good to know. Wow. It's some of the perks, Dr. Barry, of, of uh, office, I guess. You get uh, people reply to your emails pretty quickly. <laughs> they're, they're, 
So far, they haven't forgotten the heat. <laughs> <laughs> so the question I was going to ask was Dylan and I recently had a friend that was diagnosed with sleep apnea and, and we just kind of talked about it, went through the whole sleep study and, and a CPAP. And so I was just curious, it, it kind of reminded me of the time when the FAA came out with some guidance about screening people with, with a certain BMI and everybody freaked out and then they changed it. And then we never really heard anything about it. So I'd be curious kind of whatever happened with that. And additionally, can you just kind of tell us the process of a pilot thinks they have sleep apnea. I, I think that's one of the big things as an aviator is like, you know, I might have sleep apnea, but I don't want to do anything about it because I'm too afraid of losing my medical or, so, or or something like that, I think is what would go through a lot of aviators' minds. So can you just explain what that process would look like? And if you lose your medical automatically, for how long, what has to happen? Sure. I mean, it, it's pretty It's pretty easy, and I will refer you to one thing just so you can have it in your back pocket. And, you know, you get asked by pilots, what, what, what is the process? The Guide for Aviation Medical Examiners is open to anybody that wants to log in. You can do that. Just, you know, Google it if you want to get to the AME Guide. I would, if you Google it to go to the Guide for AME, what you want to do is be sure that you go to the guide where it says it's the FAA version as opposed to a, a variety of other companies that are out there that help and they're trying to interpret what's in the guide and you shouldn't you just pull up the real honest to goodness FAA publication that's out there and and I would go they've got a search engine on there put in sleep apnea and you will pull up what's called the decision considerations for disease protocols dash obstructive sleep apnea Uh, and it's got in in verbal about three pages worth of information that, that discusses it but in that particular three pages there is a link that takes you to an obstructive sleep apnea table. And and it starts with, and it's the, the typical, okay, here you're diagnosed with OSA. And and what where do you go? If 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 you have this, you go this way. If you have if no, you don't have it, you go this way. And it's a whole table down to you're cleared to go by the AME or you're gonna get held up by the AME. That that type of effect. And so it, it's really very easy. What the controversy historically was that we wanted to make it uh, very sort of quick and easy for us, or for, to say us. So I have a hard time not saying that. For the as from the FAA point of view, we wanted to make it easy. That okay, the AMEs didn't really have to do anything other than calculate a BMI, uh, body mass index, and that was based on height and weight. And so you individuals with a BMI of greater than forty probably, as I recall, have better than a 98% chance that they've oh, got wow. sleep apnea. So, I mean, it, it was quick and easy. Now, does that mean everybody that is that way? No. Can you have sleep apnea with a BMI of 28 or 24? Answer is yes, you can. It, it's not just weight related. There are other things that have to do with the airway that can collapse during sleep and this sort of a thing. So more common in people that are obese, and, and very greatly obese. So we thought that would be an easy way. We wouldn't have to ask the AMEs to do a whole lot. That, as I said earlier, caused a big, great hue and cry that we were diagnosing a disease, what we were doing, but we were being accused of, or the FAA was being accused of diagnosing a disease with one, one thing only, with no history or whatever, simply by the BMI. Yes, we weren't really diagnosing it, but yes, we were screening because of that. And if you were below that, you didn't have to get screened. We would we would probably miss a lot of people, but we would catch a lot of people that had the high BMI. So was that already being off, done with truck drivers at the time? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. The the NTSB had done a lot of work looking at truck drivers because they tended to have a higher a higher BMI just in general than the general population and, and, and fatigue obviously is a big issue for them. And so, yeah, they had done a a lot of studies with them. So, so we backed off and said, okay, we will actually come up with a protocol where the AME is going to have to do more work and the AME is going to have to look at guidelines, which are like I said, in this, this three pages that looking for symptoms, talk to the AME, talk to the pilots, about any potential problems they have with sleep, do they snore, that sort of a thing, and how arrested are they, 
and make a determination and actually do this on every single physical examination that they do on a pilot. And so you end up picking a, based on what the history is, so they got no symptoms, so they've never been on CPAP, they've never had, a, had to have a sleep study, which is, you know, that's, that's one check mark all the way down to this person is at high risk and I'm not, I can't even issue at that point. Or they're, they are on, they have been diagnosed, they are on CPAP. They have not informed the FAA. At that point, the if they're doing well, the AMA can actually issue at that point uh, along as long as there's a follow-up a sleep study. And again, if you look at this sort of decision box, it comes up and really all that has to be done is the follow-up paperwork has to come from the particular pilot within 90 days. But they go ahead and issue. So every single exam have to have a check mark on boxes one through six, which is all of, all regarding severity. The number six is you're deferred because of the concern about sleep apnea. So, like I say, I would really, I, I think it's very clear, much more clear than some of our other protocols happen to be. And if you look at the decision box, it tends to make it even even easier. So, so if you say you have a concern of sleep apnea and you're a pilot, you go, you get a sleep study. And they call you back and say, yes, you have been identified as having sleep apnea. The treatment's going to be a CPAP, and you go down that road to get one. Does that mean immediately when you've been informed that you have been diagnosed with sleep apnea, you need to self-ground until you have a treatment? Good question. And it, it, I, I would say from my personal point of view, if I was the AME and I knew about it, uh, and was asked the question, I would say, yeah, until you get, till you get uh, stabilized on this, you really ought, ought not to be flying. You know, and every pilot's going to sort of work that in his own recognizance. 6153 regulation is always in effect. And so if the pilot feels like they're really doing okay, just in general, and they don't believe they've got any, any daytime fatigue or whatever, that's going on. They weren't even aware of it, but obviously if they, if they had a concern and went and got checked out, they obviously do have some concern. So at, at that point, you probably should not be flying until you get stabilized. And like I say, the AM, if you are, if you go see your AME interim between physicals or as part of your next physical and inform the AME that I am on, I had moderately moderate sleep apnea, I was put on CPAP. I'm using it the required period of time, greater than 75%, so many hours a night of sleep, and with all meeting all those criteria that the FAA wants to see, the AME right then can issue the medical, basically a medical certificate that will get followed up as a on a special issue. So, and and I would just add that all of those CPAP machines now will will track your compliance to so your usage. And they'll they'll say how much you slept and how much you used it for each day, and and that's can be and is often uh, required by the FAA. So keep in mind, you know, if you get diagnosed with that and you're you're prescribed that CPAP, you need to be using it. And as a matter of of of, of normal practice, for peace of mind, a lot of pilots will, you know, once they get that diagnosis, they start using it. They'll call in and and you know we can confirm that they've got all their paperwork in order to make sure everything is 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 good and that they are you know legal to go on back to make sure they're not looking over their shoulder. Really, a lot of this is a CYA, and then and to make sure they got the paperwork that looks good. So when when they go in, they don't get that option six checked by their AME, so they can hand that stuff into their AME to show everything is. Everything's good, and all the boxes are, you know, are checked off for them. And I will say, I think, I think Rob is is correct uh, that I don't think there are any machines out there today. If somebody is, you know, just being diagnosed and going on CPAP, that is not electronically capable of of doing all of the. Uh, you can do the download of of the usage. There was a time when. Back when we first started this policy, I don't know how many years ago it was, but there were people that had been on CPAP already, but their machines did not do any tracking. And so the requirement for the FAA is it must be able to be downloaded. It's not just 
well, you know, trust me, this is how much I'm using it and how many nights, et cetera. That, that won't cut it anymore. Gotcha. Well, I, I know it's definitely an element of fear from, from many of the airmen that I've talked to and, and you know, they, they treat it with trepidation. I, it's probably that if you're an airline pilot and you're on the road all the time, the hardest part is probably bringing the machine with you on, on your trips, I guess. But <laughs> well, I, you know, it's funny. It really isn't that difficult. Uh, it's pretty compact now. <laughs> I'll tell you, there is one difficulty depending on where you're going. And that happens to be Singapore or rather Australia, not Singapore, Australia. Australia has made a policy that if you are using CPAP, they're going to they're going to hold you to a higher standard because they think that makes it more likely that you can, with your machine, that your actual CPAP machine is spreading the virus if you happen to have it. <laughs> and so, instead of being quarantined in a hotel, which is the standard procedure, they quarantine you in a hospital and treat you like you've got you know bad disease. Wow! So, wow! Yeah. And the, the question came up about what, 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 whether they were going to confiscate the, the CPAP machine altogether and not let you use it. And I, I think the, the outcome has been they're not doing that, but that it was important. You already got a pilot who's doing long-range flying, multiple time zones, changes that has the, uh, the, you know, the, the high possibility of fatigue just in and of itself. And now if they've also got sleep apnea and you're taking away their ability to, even if they can sleep on the backside of the clock, uh, they're not going to be able to because they don't have a CPAP machine. Not, so, and not to mention they're trying to get some sleep in a hospital. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. You got it. Yeah. Gee, many Christmas. All right. Well, I guess, you know, Max and I are doing a show uh, upcoming on how you screw your bit up and, and get the wrong schedule. I would say that would probably that take would the cake. One. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll stray. <laughs> Do not Sydney get turns stay, all month. Get a smuggle in your seat. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Well, that's an yeah, the, uh, the Some of the discussions was over whether the FAA would, like, give special um, authorization for those guys to, you know, make that trip and just miss a couple of nights without their CPAP. And they're like, no, you need to be using that all the time. Wow. I wonder if uh, when... So, oh, so now the airlines are just scheduling around, and if you've got a CPAP, you... You just don't go to Australia now. <laughs> so, so if you are doing the, that long haul flying and you have crew rest and you go into the bunk, do you have to then hook up your CPAP for that time too? Like just for a nap? I guess you, you should. Would, you would, right? Yeah, I don't know that they're actually doing that in the in the you know the bunk in the aircraft. I don't think they are doing that. We'll get an sure. we'll get an email from a listener. Yeah, that will say they do. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, if they do, that's fine. <laughs> Send us a selfie. You know, yeah. I think that battery powered one. <laughs> That's that's on that passenger shaming. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> uh, Mr. Barry, I wanted to ask you about your father, also uh, Chuck Barry. He is a pretty famous guy in the aerospace medicine community. He, for those of you that don't know, he worked at NASA as a flight surgeon and helped select the country's first astronauts and devised all these crazy tests to see if they could survive the demands of space. So can you tell us a little bit about your dad? His his dad was the was 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 a pretty famous guy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the the real Chuck Berry. <laughs> yeah, well, the other Chuck Berry did say okay. uh, <laughs> it uh, is uh, it's been an interesting and interesting journey for me and for him too. I mean, he just died basically a little over a year ago now, first of March. Uh, last year, at the age of 96, and my entire career, I have been, I will say, compared with him, contrasted with him. We actually were in practice together for 25 years before I went to the FAA. And but he he questioned me every career move I made if it looked like I was even close to following in his footsteps by cautioning me that, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? Are you doing it because you think that's what I want you to do or are you doing it because you want to do it? And if that is what you want to do, just be aware that because I did it before you, you're going to get compared to me. And if you can't, if you can't handle that, don't do it. And, and that was the admonition all the way up until I came to the FAA. And that's the one thing that I did that he never did, and the only thing. And so, I mean, he was very proud, very happy that I went to the FAA, extremely proud when I became a federal air surgeon. And so uh, he was a great mentor in that regard. And But, again, he 
he made sure that I was whatever I decided I wanted to do. I was doing it for the right reason. Which well, what what was the name of the class that he taught at UTMB? The it, after Tom Hanks's line where they were oh you know that, uh, well it, it's, that, it's it's interesting that you you talk about Apollo thirteen. He gave started giving soon after the the movie Apollo thirteen came out, which engineering wise gave and you know Hollywood wise gave a, a a fair recounting of the Apollo thirteen mission and the dangers that they were in could have died and everybody got back safely and highlighting to some degree the whole issue with measles and having to change the crew. But from an overall aerospace medicine point of view, it was, they totally trashed aerospace medicine. And that's because the movie was made based on a book by Jim Lovell, the, the commander, and that was the astronaut's point of view. Nobody, nobody was talking about the medical point of view. So he gave a lecture, and it was called Apollo 13. I'm trying to think, how did it go now? Flight surgeon horseshit or astronaut bullshit. The true, <laughs> the true aeromedical story of Apollo 13. So he... Because he, he oversaw all those missions from the aeromedical perspective, every single one of them. And all the all the testing on all the pilots and everything. It was unbelievable. Yeah, started with Mercury, started with Mercury and selection of the first seven astronauts, basically all the way through Apollo Soyuz after Skylab. So... Yeah, he was up to his ears with Apollo 13, and which I remember well. I was, I think, I was in medical school at the time when Apollo 13 was coming, but was going on. But the lecture when he started it, it was he gave the lecture with this will tell you the timing: 35 millimeter slides, actual, you know, with a with a projector and and with a VHS recording of the movie. And he would have multiple controllers. He would stop the stop the projector, click on the VHS, have the VHS show a clip, and then he would talk about what was what was true and what was not true. And there was a lot of stuff that they portrayed in the movie that never happened. And so he would show that. I don't know if you remember in the movie, there was an instance where all of the crew members ripped off their biomedical sensors, made a real big deal of it. Well, it never happened, but that was a Hollywood, hey, this looks really cool. And it didn't happen because when they had to power down everything to save power so they could get back with oxygen and water, that they decided that they were not, they didn't need to have any biomedical sensors on there because it used to So from the moment the, the explosion occurred, they all turned off their biomedical sensors entirely. And so they didn't get it again until they were actually getting ready to re-enter. And at that point in time, they, they, they still had them. Nobody took them off. And it was that kind of thing. And there was a lot of about how did, what was their real concern about measles and the fact that the crew member they, they traded out Mattingly never ended up with, uh, that was in the movie, the guy Gary Sinise played Tom Mattingly. And and it was they never he never got the measles. But if you tested him, sort of like what we're dealing with with COVID now, you know, antibody testing, etc. He had no antibodies whatsoever. He had never had the measles as far as he knew, and he had no antibodies to it. He still didn't end up getting measles, even though he had been had a very very big exposure to to German measles. And so about a month after the mission was over, he actually got immunized. And he and my dad then did public service announcements about how important it was to get immunized against rubella if you hadn't been. Huh. So. Interesting. Interesting. I did not. That, that's some good trivia. I, Dr. Brayer, you're breaking news. Yeah. You're breaking news that Hollywood does not portray aviation correctly. It, well, I, I'll tell you that lecture now, I have given it, I think, three times, and it's it's entirely it's entirely up to date. It's all HD quality video from the movie and, and it's all merged in with uh, PowerPoint and it's, it's a cool lecture. I think it still opens a lot of eyes for even it, the generation that, that wasn't even born when Apollo 13 went. Is it on YouTube by chance? No, it's not, Don't but I've got it. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we'll have to, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to see that. How, how do you see that? If you, if you want to see it. Well, it, 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 it has to be, with a person giving it. Oh, I see. Okay. The, the audio, the audio, when I say it's, you know, there are, are gaps where it requires explanation as to what's happening. And then, and then 
as soon as that's over, you advance to the next thing, and that happens to be uh, video. And then there's a pause, and you talk about either a still a still PowerPoint slide or Got something it. like that. That would be interesting. I, I would like to see that. Rob, let us know when you have that set up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll work on that. We'll we'll get it done. <laughs> I remember Chuck Berry saying that, you know, that at the beginning of the space missions, it, it really was the Wild West. And he said, you know, we had no idea what kind of negative G's somebody could, you know, a, a human could handle. And so he was like, he said it was a lot of his doctors testing on themselves, like sitting on the slide and, you know, going 100 miles an hour and then coming to a complete stop and, you know, 50 feet and, and you know, high speed cameras videotaping their eyeballs you know, extending and coming back. And, oh, I mean, crazy I'd also, times. I'd also like to see that. <laughs> yeah. <Jeez. laughs> this would be a good webinar, Rob. You can put on how you want. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was how we learned about aerospace physiology. Yeah. Right. It's amazing. <laughs> It's amazing. Well, fellows, we certainly appreciate both of your time and expertise. And Dr. Barry, just one of the many reasons that uh, folks should consider using Harvey Watt for coverage, just uh, the, the resources at their fingertips are really impressive. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite an honor to speak with you and, and get your insight. Thanks, everyone. All right. Well, thanks to our friends at uh, Harvey Watt for uh, joining us and breaking it down. It's, I mean, how awesome is it to know if you're their customer, you've got the top guy, the former top guy as a resource. Yeah. It, to navigate and all the I bureaucracy. I think he demonstrated his resourcefulness yeah. during so that interview. Goes, oh, let, me, let, me, let me email the current. Oh, he got back to me. I'm like, <laughs> I've never heard of the FAA responding <laughs> in a matter of minutes. We're not even doing an ad read for Harvey Watt because that was the best ad read you could do. <laughs> so anyways, uh, thanks to them. All right, we're going to play some clips from the uh, golf tournament now. We So basically, we had a setup on a hole and we brought our microphones, our mixer. We had um, a table set up, a tent, a banner, like this whole thing. We're on the tee box. So this was at the Arizona Business Aviation Association's annual fundraiser. So we raised money for the, the scholarships for folks in business aviation. So everybody from the industry comes out and plays golf, takes their clients out and has a good time. And they foolishly let us come out. Well, and the thing is, we didn't have headphones on. No. We had all of our audio was piped to speakers. Yeah. And so we were there. And <laughs> what was your... Well, what, People would hit a shot and shank it off into the the desert or something. What would you say? I uh, just this is disgusting. Yeah, you just go disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were kind of pretending to be golf commentators, and so it was funny. Yeah. We were doing a little, a little everything. You, were, you yeah. watch a lot of golf. Yeah, I watch golf, so I kind of remember. I was a, I won or I was a finalist in the Jim Nance impersonation yeah, thing on that the Dan was Patrick funny. show. Yeah. And then uh we had a golf cannon at our hole oh, too. Yeah. So people would kneel like it was an RPG and yeah, they would watch the, the golf ball. It was pretty funny. Yeah. And I, we had binoculars so we're spotting and yeah. We'd play and, music. Uh, oh, what was the music you were playing? Oh, uh, we were <laughs> Max playing this, was our DJ. Yeah, we were playing this big, you know, like mashup mix that with all this EDM and stuff. It was pretty <laughs> funny. It was some people were into it somewhere. We got a couple of good industry tidbits from some of the folks that came yeah, through. Yeah, we had people step up to the mic. We had our uh one of our listeners. Yeah. Um We had one of our uh listeners, Rachel. She came up, told a good story about how we met and uh she was bringing us some cocktails to loosen oh, yeah. things up. Yeah. Yeah. That's just what we needed. <laughs> so yeah, it was super fun. So, so there's some highlights. If you, it's all tomfoolery from here on out. So uh, feel free to skip to the end. If you. We thought it was funny. No, it's hilarious. Yeah. You stick it out. So. And you're on the air. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, this is Paul David uh, with Honeywell Aerospace uh, Business Aviation. And I lead the uh, MSP, the maintenance service plan organization. And uh, just want to say to uh, the organization how much we appreciate um, everybody getting through the pandemic and um, uh, in safe and, and uh, ready for uh, recovery. And, um, and certainly, if it's a good time to think about uh, maintenance programs, feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to help and talk to you. Thanks very much. Thank Thanks, you, Paul. Yeah. Uh, Paul, I have a follow-up question for you. Yeah. Is it true that MSP stands for money sent to Phoenix? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's money sent to Paul. Oh, gotcha. 
<laughs> MSP is always like it's. I always tell people MSP is like lawyers. It's it's something you you hate until all of a sudden you need it really really bad. Yeah. If you need like, my GoFundMe page, I'll give you the link. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming out, guys. Thanks. Joining us today is Jim Anderson from Star Aviation. Welcome. Thanks for coming out to thanks the golf guys. tournament. Yeah, thanks yeah. for being here. This is yeah. awesome. So can you tell us, you know, the industry's been talking a ton about insurance rates for business aviation aircraft. They're going up. Can you explain in a couple of words why that is right now? Well, um, yeah, you know, the, 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 thing, the thing about the market is lack of supply, yeah. right? Uh, the fleet has remained relatively steady, so the demand has remained constant. We saw a period of time where supply of insurance markets increased, and so that naturally just brought the pricing down, more competition. Those markets have ceased. They withdrawn from the market, and they, they withdrew in droves, actually. So we're, we're kind of back down to uh, a level of capacity that's, one, sustainable, and two, uh, as you guys know, uh, business aviation, uh, these are not inexpensive machines. Right. So when damage happens... Uh, it's rather expensive. Cost repairs have gone up. Litigation costs have gone up. Uh, so that's it in a nutshell. Right. Is that a few words? So yeah. do you see any <laughs> relief in the future, or is, it, is this uh, the new norm, would you say? You know, um, I don't see any relief coming from tort liability. That's a real problem when it comes to uh, not just aviation insurance, but insurance getting lawyers, in general. Getting in the way of everything. Well, you know, I think that there, <laughs> the beauty of the system is everybody has a right to recover, right? If, you, if you're injured or wronged, you have a right to a financial settlement. Uh, but I think in, in recent years, some of those financial settlements have gotten way out of control. And there, there does need to be some, some limits put in there somewhere. What that is, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I think that's one step. <laughs> Second step, I don't think that uh, aircraft are going to get any cheaper to repair, <laughs> guys i mean right. it's it's an expensive thing that we do and uh that's just the way it is so uh, with with those two things being uh constant i don't see that there's any immediate relief in the future now somebody could decide to come in and disrupt the market lower right, prices sure. but it's going to be short term because those those factors that drive the price claims are not going to change so it's input output seems like the guys at aviation two that come back into that market are then the ones that leave the market again. That's and right. then there's these, you know, several companies that are always there. Right. You guys being one of them, right? Right. Yeah, yeah we've been around since, uh, the company I work for has been around since 1919. We didn't do aviation the entire time, but uh, we have roots going back uh, a long ways. And uh, we're, you know, we look at the market as a marathon, not a sprint. So when others come in and, and drive the rates down to unsustainable rates, it's like, okay, you know, that's, that's fine. We'll weather the storm. But, uh, you know, that's the way we, we see ourselves. Okay. Got awesome. It. All Thanks, right, Jim. Jim thank Appreciate you. Hey, Thanks, guys. All right. Today at the golf tournament, we have a very special guest. Her name is Rachel. Uh, Rachel, why don't you tell everybody the story of how we first met? Well, it's actually a pretty interesting story. I'd been a fan of your podcast for quite a while. And uh, I work for Southwest. And I was able to... Um, get on a trip just kind of coincidentally I was sitting on reserve one day in the lounge and they called me to go to Orange County and I walked up to the plane and as I always do um, as a pilot myself I go up and I'm really excited to meet the pilot so I walked into the cockpit and started talking to uh to these guys that were going to be my pilots for the day and uh the first officer which was you spoiler alert <laughs> uh you were kind of talking to me and I noticed you're you were kind of a newer employee and I asked you what you had done previous to coming to Southwest Airlines, and you had said that you flew business aviation. And all of a sudden, in my brain, it just clicked, like, <laughs> wow, I know exactly who this is. And the said, man, <laughs> the myth, the legend. <laughs> That's right. And uh, I said, do you, do you happen to have a podcast? And I just remember it was a pretty cool moment. Yeah, it was funny. I was like, what? Like, you know, <laughs> you listen to our show. Wait a minute. That's so weird. But we only have 10 downloads. Yeah. So how is this possible? <laughs> yeah, it was kind of in the You're early. 10% of our base. Yeah. <laughs> early stages, but it was pretty, pretty serendipitous. I yeah, felt it's like. pretty funny. Yeah. So. Awesome. Awesome, awesome moment. Yeah. That's Rachel, everybody. All right. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks.
too. All right, step up to the mic, Brad. We've got Brad Hat from Hat Associates out joining us today on the golf course. Welcome, Brad. Thanks for supporting EZBA and scholarships. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate it very much. Uh, great cause. Uh, I see you have the Pinnacle Aviation uh, oh, shirts right. on, so yeah. you know I got to give Casey you yeah, know, a little heart. Right. Oh, yeah, boy, Ken absolutely. Casey. Yeah, so I, uh, mountain bike with kids. Uh, okay. yeah. All right. So, Brad, you know, the marketplace is so hot right now. We've seen so much activity. Can you give us just a little update on what's the hottest Any softening, segment? Yeah. Anything? What are you yeah, seeing? It's, uh, you know, it's been interesting and, uh, you know, kind of those silver linings to the whole COVID, yeah. unfortunately, is that, you know, since about June of last year, we've just been pretty much on fire. Yeah. Uh, activity has been excellent, and uh, we've pretty much sold out all of our inventory. Right. You know, so I have a question. for inventory. So you, we've read a couple things about yeah. people that were making that big rot rush for the bonus depreciation last year. Yep. And and then you've read things where people say, oh, they have buyer's remorse now, and they didn't understand the operating. Is that true or no? Uh, you know, I think it's just conjecture and mm. people trying to That's second kind of guess. My feeling. You know, uh, yeah. Is there a spike right now and a bump? A lot of it I see is not so much the bonus depreciation. I mean, it's a factor, but it's first-time buyers, you know, people yeah. that aren't putting their family or their business people on an airplane. Yeah. So they're on an airline. Yeah. So they're wanting to buy their own airplanes. Now, they may figure out what it costs to own and operate those airplanes. Right, right. <laughs> that may be the issue, I think. Yeah. Sure. Oh, is uh, it, that's never changed, though, right? No, because once you do that <laughs> bonus depreciation, you're hooked for life. Yeah. Absolutely. That's because right. when you sell it, in, you don't you replace pay it, it back. you got to recapture <laughs> Recapture. Yeah, yeah. So, but now business has uh, been really good uh, pretty much across the board. Yeah. Good like deal. midsize, uh, you know, our sweet spot's kind of in that 3 to $10 million yeah. range. So, so if right. someone had a CJ4 they wanted to list, you, you would take that uh, list? We in? would absolutely <laughs> take that. So, you know, send them our way. Don't tell Casey. Yeah, though. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Hat, thanks Brad. Uh, Brad right. Hat, Hat and Associates. Thank you. Have a good one. Max has the glasses ready, the binoculars. He's scanning. Brace Eric yourself looking, for the getting the wind. The kick. Dialing. A launch has been detected. Full release by Eric. Max, can we see anything? We think Negative it's in contact. This, we I believe think it's he's in the Duncan Aviation sand trap here on the left hand side. I believe he's missed the mark yet again, folks. It's just. Sadly, par for the course. Caution, terrain. Caution, terrain. And now Chris, he's looking at uh, trying for a little redemption. I think that wind is blowing uh, right, right to, to left, left folks. Yeah, it is a right to left wind. One MOA, MOA hold over. Bend your knees, Chris. Oh, send it's it. Up. It's been sent. What do we think? West looks in disgust. <laughs> No? Negative contact, Negative folks. contact here, boys. We Minimum. call them the Desert Boys for no... Uh, for the Desert Dogs. Thanks for your support for AZBA Scholarships, gentlemen. Enjoy your round. Your name? Yeah, hey, I'm, my name's Mark White. I'm with Duncan Aviation out of Provo, Utah. Welcome, Mark. So we have a brand new 250,000 square foot facility up there with a 50,000 square foot hangar, and we are spooling up on the Gulf Streams. Really? Yes, sir. To do yeah. what? Uh, maintenance. Uh, oh. Yeah, um, I was with Gulfstream 15 years, and I came on board uh, about a year ago, and that's what we're doing up in uh, Provo. We're bringing on the Gulfstream uh, mechanical, avionics, and refurbs up there. That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. Uh, now, Duncan, famous for doing a lot of crazy paint jobs. Do you guys have any in the pipeline right now? Uh, we do. We've painted over 32 airplanes there since we've opened two years ago. So Awesome. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We we're... just painted a 7500 up in Provo. Oh, really? It's got to be one of the first. First outside the factory. Awesome. Yeah, nice. Duncan's been tasked with uh, rebranding for Jet Edge. We're on our uh, third airplane uh, for Jet Edge out of Van Nuys. Nice. Which are operating a little over 100 airplanes. So, All right, last question. What's the worst paint job you've ever seen on an airplane? <laughs> Be honest. Mm. I don't know. It came out of West Star, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming out, fellas. Well All right. Joining right. us, uh, who who do we have on the microphone here? Can you introduce yourself? My name is Perry Bischoff. I'm with MRO Insider. 
Welcome, Perry. Thanks for coming out today. Can you tell yeah. us what is MRO Insider? Well, first of all, it's not a magazine. Okay. It's pretty much a running <laughs> joke today. So uh, we're a, a tech company. We have an app that basically it's like a one, one-stop uh, request system for quoting maintenance. And we're just launching an FBO feature. So you send out one request. It goes location-based wherever you're at. You need services. Um, FBO feature will do fuel and a bunch of other stuff like that. So eliminate the phone calls, the wow. emails, everything. Wow, that's actually pretty cool. Yeah. I've it's never like heard of that. AOG ordering an Uber, basically. Wow. And, um, so much easier. All on the app. That's wow. incredible. So, that's yeah. pretty cool. And accountability if you're managing a flight department. You just say, listen, I solicited this everywhere. Yeah. What do you want from me? You can review the gets. shops afterward, everything. Wow. Ooh, that's, that's pretty cool. Can you swipe left or right when you get the options? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that's a later feature. No, but we're going to develop okay. that. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks Barry. Yeah. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. All right, who do we, who do we have joining us here? This is Stephanie Landman with Leading Edge Real Estate. We do aviation real estate in Scottsdale, Arizona, and we are all big fans of the Twenty One Five podcast. Um, you guys are a lot of fun, and we learn a lot of information. And we always is it tune good in. information? Do you think? Oh yeah, absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Awesome. And Stephanie, you're working on your certificates, also private pilot's license, and then Ooh. keep moving forward. But just for a hobby. Awesome. Yeah. That's Just for good. fun. I love and, it. And the um, real estate market is extremely cold right now, I imagine. No, right? yeah. Yeah. A lot of inventory, not many buyers. Yeah. Very tough. <laughs> so hot. Everybody's looking to upgrade their aircraft, um, build larger hangars. So we're very busy. So awesome. It's good. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks for, for coming out support. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Court. All right. Who's next on the microphone here? Uh, this is Tommy. Tommy Kirkhoff. I'm with Big Ass Fans. Yes. Um, oh. Hope you guys are big ass fans of those. Um, <laughs> fans of you guys, uh, just happy to be here. Brought you a couple gifts here. Oh, oh sweet. some koozies. Yeah, some koozies. I don't really drink, but thank yeah, you. Yeah, we, we don't. Yeah, for soda. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Anything like that. Thank you. Uh, Tommy, you guys are putting those fans in aircraft hangers all the time, right? Correct. Yep. They just put one in my CrossFit gym. Did they? Very thankful. Dude, oh, they have it yeah. at the loading dock for the train at Phoenix everywhere. Yep. It's amazing. Yeah. No the sky tram, they're everywhere. Ha- have they ever tried That's to it. mount one on an aircraft? I do not think so. You guys going to get into the <laughs> propeller business. <laughs> yeah. Right. Why not? Yeah. Well, you know, we are big ass. We'll That's just right. we'll go worldwide. And do Breaking it. news here. <laughs> Look for that soon. The big ass airplane. All right. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Tommy. Next at the whole seven outpost for 21.5, we've got Trevor from Four Flight. Welcome, Trevor. Thank you for having me. Trevor, I got to tell you, you guys just released an update to the app that does the um, animated wind. Yes. That is, have, I see, have you seen that, Max? I just saw like screenshots. It's the coolest time. thing I've ever seen. It's, it is so awesome. Who came up with that idea? You can take credit for it now. Go ahead. Well, I'll take credit, but definitely uh, our team. I okay. mean, we're, we're always uh, uh, focused on bringing new capability to our customers. Where do these ideas come from? That's what I want to know. They come from our customers. They come from our our really intelligent uh, leadership team. We're always focused on innovation and really trying to be a step ahead of what pilots want in the industry. That's awesome. awesome. And I love the uh, runway analysis. I've been demoing that for yes. our Challenger. It's incredible. Yeah, it's uh, built into the uh, flight planning workflow, so it really saves pilots time, yes. provides quick answers, accurate answers. It's uh it's an amazing uh, capability now in ForeFlight. Bringing it all together. Yeah. ForeFlight at the forefront of aviation. That's right. I like it. Yeah, Trademark that. Of, yeah. That's yes. already trademarked. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Trevor. Thanks for having me. Um, if you go ahead and introduce yourself, say what your, your name and the company you're with. Sure. Yeah. Jim Blessing with Airfleet Capital. Uh, we're based here at Chandler Airport in Chandler, Arizona. Do I need to be closer? No, it's fine. Oh, right. oh okay. Yeah, so no, uh, so we finance aircraft. Uh, we focus on owner flown. So um, generally people that uh, enter the airplane turn left. That's kind of our, our <laughs> stick. And uh, everything from single engine piston up to light jets, you know, even medium jets. And there's a golf club right between my legs right now. It's just awkward. <laughs> that's not a golf club. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. That's Greg Renna. He's our head of sales. So. Hey, Greg. Welcome yeah, to the show. Really Look at the show, well. Greg. Get along really well. What are you doing down there, Greg? That's weird. Yeah. <laughs> 
But uh, it's a very good market right now. Yeah. So uh, finance is very hungry for um, for any lending, a lot of liquidity in the market. So uh, it's an attractive market, good interest rates, uh, good reason to finance. You know, First Republic came out with a report a few weeks ago, said that the next five years we should see a 15% annualized return in the stock markets. So if you're paying 4% money for uh, a loan, you should be borrowing and using your money in the stock market to get that return over the next five years. That's an annualized 15% return. Wow. So really good reason to 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 borrow and at, at the cheap rates that the industry has it, it, with just about anything right now. Yeah. It's it's a good environment to borrow. Okay. Now I got a question. You specialize in owner flown. Yeah. It sounds easy to finance. Tom Haig is here. Tom, is it easy to insure owner flown? Go ahead, flown? Mike. Come hey, step up to right, Mike. Tom, Tom. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, here's the golf club between yeah, your yeah, right. well, uh, it, it all depends on uh, the asset value and the experience of the pilot as far as insuring owner flown. So the pinch in the market right now is is high whole value uh, owner flown turbine mm-hmm. and low experience. Couple that with low experience, but anything else? If you're under five million and you've got relatively good time, you got Max Palmer, Dylan, Dylan mm-hmm. uh, hours Thank in your you, logbook. Tom. Piece of cake. Uh, market's so, still flush. It's what's good. the What's the deal that comes across your your desk where you're just like, oh, is it like the guy that buys the brand new CJ4 that's coming out of the Baron, or like what's the What's the nightmare deal? No, the nightmare deal is the is the 84 year old guy. <laughs> That likes to talk, and he's got a he's got a six thousand uh, dollar J three Cub that he's restoring in his in his backyard. And he wants to fly it off his driveway, <laughs> but but he wants to talk. So and he wants check to, in he wants once to, a week. Yeah. He wants to take a couple hours up of your time telling you about <laughs> when he used to fly. Inverted. Is that when you sent him to Daniel Chung for no, no, for tax no, advice? No. Daniel Chung, up on the mic next. Oh, Daniel, uh, oh. Daniel, uh, go Long-time ahead. Longtime Cirrus owner, one of Tom Hague's <laughs> favorite clients. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Daniel, no time. Yeah. Uh, go ahead and on the record. Can can you just announce uh, how long uh, 100% bonus depreciation will be uh, around for used airplanes? Uh, go ahead and go on the record right now. Well, I am on CNN regularly giving my predictions, so <laughs> this is this is gold. I think we will have bonus depreciation for the next two years. I don't think they will touch it. So, But anything can change. So if you're in the market, you really should jump on it and make sure you do get it, get the transaction done before the Congress yeah. may change the law. But even though I think it's a very, it's not a very likely chance. So I think we will have bonus depreciation for a while. All right. Daniel Chung. You heard it here first, record. everybody. That's right. The trifecta. I love it. Thank you, fellas. Five years of experience you're letting just go. Okay. Right come on up. I come mean, on up and on, introduce they yourself. Sell, they sell airplanes. They the know yeah. All right. Wait, wait. Right. Wait a minute. And that guy. Right. Do you know, you know a legend in aviation guy. sales, yeah. also oh, known as Ken Casey? Uh, Ken, I know Ken Casey, but I don't admit it. <laughs> Allegedly. No, uh, Dave Kilcup, International Jets out of Gig Harbor, Washington. Yes. And Boise, Idaho. All right. Idaho, right down there. I That's saw right. that. Idaho? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah, no, 25 years in, in buying and selling. A lot of owner flown airplanes, a lot of entrepreneurial type people in the light turbine market that we deal with. So that's why I'm going to get his card after we're done talking because that is a that's a tough that's a tough sell right now um especially in the seattle marketplace where you got a lot of young multi-millionaires billionaires that can buy whatever they want luckily the weather there is usually good so oh the weather's totally good in seattle (laughs) two weeks bfr no (laughs) problem those two weeks in september june and july yeah and uh what is the hottest market in the light jets right now would you say hottest airplane phenom 300 really really still hot 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 yeah um uh, Hotter than the late model CJs, huh? CJ4 is strong. CJ3 Plus is strong. Phenom still stronger. Big cabin, mm-hmm. air stair door, real laboratory that you can actually use. Um, not. Is there an APU on that thing? No. That's a bummer. That's the bu- Okay, we yeah. were just talking. I was no, holy no, sure. Yeah, right. Literally yesterday. Up to a Look at one pull up and, no, I'm, and an old dry, I'm an old dry pilot. I still fly a bunch. Encores, Encore Pluses, and Sovereigns. Sovereigns a nice airplane. A- Skylight in the bathroom. That's key. Oh, skylight in the bathroom in a oh. CJ4. That's a new thing. That's a foul, yeah, that's a foul. and an Astra. Uh, if you're old, you know the Astras have had those for years. Yeah. You know, take it from a guy that's yeah. been taking a leak in the lab on the ramp with the window open, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, the, the skylight go. would have been good. Uh, skylight would have been good. Yeah. All right. So, uh, folks, contact Dave Kilcup if you want to list your Falcon 10, Hawker 700, uh, Lear 25, <laughs> Hindenburg, so Saber Liner, Hindenburg. Jetstar. Yeah. Jets, your Jetstar <laughs> specialist. Yeah. That is awesome. Thank you so much for that shameless plug. Owner Flow and Jet Star, right here, folks. Max, we've got another uh, another golfer coming up to the microphone. Who who do we have here? Uh, Tommy Aoki. Tommy, welcome. Who are you with? Any Thank relation you. to Steve? 
Uh, no, but okay. uh, I, I mean, <laughs> I've flown seats before. Have, have you really? He let me sit backstage while they were throwing the cakes. It was no, pretty really? Yeah, yeah, and, was cool. and Calvin Harris, you flew too, right? Yeah. Great. Listen, Listen I'm very in touch with the community. This guy. Anyways, this is anyway, Tommy Aoki. Go ahead, Tommy. Tell us a little bit about CB Sky Share. So CB Sky Share, we're based out of uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Okay. Uh, we are specializing in uh, fractional jet sharing or shared ownership, mm -hmm. uh, the CB Sky Share program. So um, look us up, cbskyshare.com. Um, we also do a full charter service, uh, managed aircraft, the full services for anything in private aviation. What kind of airplanes are you guys doing the fractional Um We have PC-12, CJ-2, and a G-200. We have Dang. a fleet of about 13 aircraft right now. It's so generous of you to donate a couple hours to our listeners on the line today. We really appreciate that. <laughs> cbskyshare.com. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Hey, come see us tonight at uh, Jet Aviation, 4 to 7 o'clock. <laughs> see you then. It. Thanks for coming in, guys. Thanks. All right. Go for it. Hey guys, this is Michael Patwin, Vice President of CB SkyShare. Just wanted to let you know that we're hiring pilots in the platforms of G200, CJ2, and PC12. We just opened a new office in Scottsdale at Jet Aviation, um, and we're hiring. So reach out to us. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Sir, welcome to the 21.5 podcast. Can you say your name and who you're with? Certainly. I'm David Best, and I'm with Jet Aviation. Welcome, David. Uh, David, you guys just recently opened... The newest FBO at the Scottsdale Airport. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Absolutely. We just opened up our great facility in Scottsdale. We got a 30,000 square foot hangar, 8,000 of terminal space, and we are very proud to be an investor in the airport. Absolutely. Well, we're excited to have you on the field. I can personally say I've been into the pilot lounge and inventoried all the snacks and beverages available. It's top notch. That's what we like. As we say in Jet Aviation, we're enabling global flight with passion. I love it. Thanks, David. <laughs> Run, God. All right. Well, I think you've wasted enough time today listening to episode number 54. You know, the reviews would be contradictory. Yeah, that guy's that. blasting his thighs listening to this right now. So there's guys in holiday inns all over the country enjoying <laughs> coffee in plastic cups. I don't even do. I don't even. Do you brew the hotel room coffee anymore? I don't even. I never. Uh, I uh, I would if it was a super early, like showtime yeah not into the cup i would put it in my own cup i'm already plotting my how i'm gonna step my coffee game up for my eventual return okay we'll stick it stick around for that incredible teaser yeah everyone's gonna be amazing. on the edge of their seats i'm sure um folks if you want to get a hold of us uh, flight advice or just any other uh, feedback it's info at 215podcast.com you can visit the website, also 215podcast.com. We've got the, um, you can send in a flight advice. There's a form there to send it in anonymously if you don't even want to use your name or anything. Um, and then uh, donate. You can read all the show notes on the website, links to everything we talk about. Um, so always surprised how few people understand how podcasts work with the show notes stuff. So if you're in your podcast app, you just scroll down. I put all the stuff in there and they click. And we get so many emails. What was that thing you talked about? Where's the link to this? And it's, it's all right there. So in case you don't know that. That's where Thank you, you to Dylan. Yeah. Um, a couple of weeks from now, we'll be back, Max. But uh, until then, remember. Flexibility. It is the key to air power. We'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. And, 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 never, and, uh, and never take financial advice from a pilot. <laughs> see you guys. The statements made in this show are our own opinions and do not reflect, nor were they under any direction from any of our employers.